many of you know what chat GPT is? Now, AI is, you know, it's a threat too, but if we, if, we were, if we had our act together ethically, it's possible that AI could become a, a useful servant rather than a tyrannical master. Jordan Peterson, renowned for his sharp insights and frank opinions, delves into the very core of the issue, warning us about the impending danger of AI, a warning that cannot be ignored. They're always after the next new thing as fast as possible. So it's a machine that's speeding along as fast as a machine possibly can. And, and God only knows where it's headed in some sense, right? Because there's so many things happening at the same time that it's impossible to keep track. And we don't even know what these things are. As Peterson articulates his fears, you can't help but feel the weight of his words. His warnings echo through your mind. He paints a bleak picture of a future where the line between humans and machines blurs and we lose sight of our humanity. But the new AI systems will be able to extract out patterns from the world itself, from images and so forth, and then be able to test their linguistic constructions against the world. And so they'll practice just like scientists. And the most advanced models are going to use text and image and action as well because they'll be able to model human action. You know this, there are things coming down the pipeline on the artificial intelligence front that are just gonna make your hair stand on end within the next year, because there is so much transformation going on in that domain. And, and that's been the case, particularly for the last six months, that it's almost unimaginable. How many of you know what chat GBT is? Okay. So I'll, not very many. So I'll tell you what Chad GPT is, just so you know, because you need to know this. And I don't know what sort of technological revolution this is. Gutenberg press level? It's something like that. So this AI system, it's a general language processing model, was released about a week ago, a week and a half ago. And uh, I, I went and interacted with it. You can, it's an AI system, artificial intelligence system. It basically is trained on, well, a massive corpus of, of spoken and, or of text. Peterson's words are a call to action, a wake-up call for us to come together and address the pressing issue of AI. As we seek to advance our technology, we gotta remember to protect our humanity or risk losing it altogether. AI systems will be able to calibrate their linguistic knowledge against knowledge of images in the world soon. And that's basically what scientists do, right? Because scientists will take a verbal hypothesis and then test it against the actual world. And if the hypothesis and the world fit, then you think, well, that's scientifically verified. And Keller thinks that, that AI systems will be able to do that pretty soon. And pretty soon means as soon as someone builds one that can do it, because we, the tech is already in place. And so I have no idea what that's gonna mean, you know, and it could easily lead us astray. So here's something that's gonna happen in the next year. So imagine now you're a lonesome, lonesome guy and you can, uh, you can get a digital friend, woman, and uh, she can talk to you like ChatGPT talks to you and listen like ChatGPT listens to you, which is maybe if you're really lonesome and alienated, more than anyone has ever listened to you in your life. And then soon she'll not only listen to you as a text interface, but she'll be a fully rendered 3D, well, let's say 2D photorealistic, fully rendered animation indistinguishable from a genuine image of a person, image of a genuine person, and then that'll be 3D for your, you know, Oculus headset, and then, well, that'll be sexual in like, just right now, that'll be the, that'll be the value proposition, right, is you'll be able to turn your virtual girlfriend into your virtual sex partner, and who knows what that'll do. Robots have been tricky, you know, but I can't imagine that's more than 10 years away. And that's just one thing that's going to happen, maybe not even the most surreal thing. You know, pretty soon we'll be contending with the fact that 
someone will be able to generate a photo realistic version of Donald Trump and have him say something absolutely reprehensible and spread it everywhere just before election night and there'll be real confusion about whether he said it or didn't so what do we do when our representations of reality can be falsified now you know I was talking to my son about that today and he thinks we'll get into an arms race right away because there'll be technologies that can detect whether video is artificial but then you know there'll be a race because other technologies will learn how to fool that technology and you know maybe we'll be able to stay on the edge where we can still detect what's real and what isn't but I don't think we're doing a very good job of that right now on social media you know because social media it's kind of like the world except it's way more demented and the problem with that is that it makes the whole world look demented. So my concern fundamentally is that these machines will reflect us ethically. And that should be frightening because I wouldn't say that our ethical house is particularly in order. So they're going to magnify what we are. You know, so, you know, the Google guys can talk about the mind of God. But that's making the presumption that the thing that we're building will be a good thing. And... I don't think that it will be a good thing because it will reflect us. You know, you hear babies have no theory of mind. It's like, uh, yeah, no, they can imitate. That's pretty bloody amazing, man. Like you haven't seen robots that can do that yet. Although there are robots now that you can teach by moving their, their arms. You move their arms and then they'll do it. And so you can actually program them by moving them and then they'll just repeat it. And so they're getting damn close to imitation. They're really getting close. And then look the hell out, man, because they're going to be imitating each other as well as us. And they're going to do it so fast, you just won't be able to believe it. Now, the guys that are building the autonomous cars, like they don't think they're building autonomous cars. They know perfectly well what they're doing. They're building fleets of mutually intercommunicating autonomous robots and each of them will be able to teach the other because their nervous system will be the same. And when there's 10 million of them, when one of them learns something, all 10 million of them will learn it at the same time. So they're not gonna have to be very bright before they're very, very, very smart. Because us, you know, we'll learn something, you have to imitate it, it's like, God, that's hard. Or I have to explain it to you and you have to understand it and then you have to act it out. We're not connected wirelessly with the same platform, but robots, they are. And so once those things get a little bit smart, they're not gonna stop at a little bit smart for very long. They're gonna be unbelievably smart, like overnight. So, and they're imitating the hell out of us right now too, because we're teaching them how to understand us. Every second of every day, the net is learning what we're like. It's watching us, it's communicating with us, it's imitating us, and it's gonna know, it already knows in some ways more about us than we know about ourselves. You know, there's lots of reports already of people getting um, pregnancy, ads or ch ads for infants sometimes before they know they're pregnant but often before they've told their families and the way that that happens is the net is watching what they're looking at and inferring with its artificial intelligence and so maybe you're pregnant and that's just tilting you a little bit right to interest in things that you might not otherwise be interested in the net tracks that then it tells you what you're what you're after and does that by offering you an advertisement so it's reading your unconscious mind so well, so that's what's happening. After humans become completely dependent on AI and we either merge or become a zoo, where can we find meaning? <laughs> well, there's a lot of hypotheticals in that question. Um, I, don't, I don't really know how to answer that because I don't, I don't think it's within the scope of anyone's vision to, to, to predict even what's likely to happen over the next 40 years because the rate of technological advance is so insane that in some sense all bets are off. And I really mean that. Um, you know, I, I have a variety of contacts in Silicon Valley and there are people there that I've been communicating with who believe that it's already within their power to build a, an AI machine that will have higher computational capacity than the human brain. That's within five years. Now that assumes that they've got the computational capacity of the brain properly calculated, and that's not necessarily the case. But even if they're out by a factor of 10, that's not many iterations past that. Now, maybe we don't understand the brain at all. That's certainly possible. It isn't just 
the rapid increase in computational power that's doubling so quickly. I don't know if any of you, how many of you watched the Boston Dynamics videos? So, how many of you don't know what I'm talking about? Okay, so one of the things I would highly recommend is that you go home and go to YouTube and, and look up Boston Dynamics, because it's the most advanced robotics company in the world, and it was a DARPA project, so a, an American defense uh, company, and they were bought by Google five years ago, and they had pretty damn impressive robots five years ago. They were autonomous, and, and uh, so they could, they could uh, make their way over rough terrain, including snow, up hills, if they slipped on the ice, they could right themselves. If you pushed them over, they could pu put themselves back up. And that's not joystick controlled. That was all autonomous. And they ran on gasoline powered motors and were capable of, of autonomous action for an hour and a half or so. And I looked at the last iteration and it's a small robot about this big and it has a hand that looks like a head. And it's so sophisticated that it can it can gyrate to music spontaneously and it can keep its head in the same place while it does it like a chicken. And so, and it can open doors, and it's like it's it's quite the remarkable creature. And and the the rate of advance from the first robot, which was called Big Dog, which is a very terrifying thing to 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 watch, Big Dog, to this is quite staggering. And that's only going to increase insanely that that ability over the next five years. And you know, there's something very strange about robots that people don't generally think about. Some people do. Imagine you have a robot and it can learn a few things through imitation and we already have robots that can do that because you can program a robot, industrial robot that's worth about $20,000. You can move its arm the way you want it to move its arm and then it will move its arm that way. Imitation is coming up very rapidly and the capacity to autonomously learn is already there to some degree. Let's say you have a robot that can learn a little bit, not much, but then let's say you have 20 million of them and they're all exactly the same, and they have exactly the same architecture. And so what that means, as soon as one robot learns something, then all 20 million of them learn it. And so if each robot is learning one thing a day, then the whole herd is learning 20 million things a day. And so the, once, once, once we hit a certain threshold, the rate of increase in robotic intelligence is going to be just something that we can't even comprehend. I talked to the people at uh, Tesla, who ran the autonomous car division, and they know perfectly well they weren't creating autonomous cars. Because an autonomous car isn't a car. It's a robot. And it's not just a robot, it's a fleet of robots, and it's a fleet of intelligent robots. And some of the functions that it will perform will be the functions of a car. But to think about that as a car is just, you're just confused. It's like to think of a car as a horseless carriage. Um, the, the person who ran the division told me that They'd already had plans instantiated so that all the Tesla cars map the roads and they're mapping them at an increasingly high level of resolution and then they share the data and they expected to get to the point where the car would be able to predict where the bumps on the road were that it was approaching and adjust the suspension so that when you hit the bump you wouldn't feel that at all because the suspension would have mapped the bump before it encountered it. And so, and that's just, you know, it seems like a trivial example in some sense, but it's not trivial. It's, it's, it's an example of how unbelievably quickly this technology is progressing. So, now, what are we going to do about that? Well, I'm hoping that we're going to be smart enough as individuals and careful enough and ethical enough and, and fast so that when we, when we, as we continue to produce increasingly intelligent computers and robots that are going to mimic us, that they mimic something good enough so that it doesn't destroy us. And so a lot of that's going to depend on the ethical integrity of the people who are working on these advanced systems. And it's not like the people who are working on those systems, at least some of them don't understand that because they do. And they also understand the tremendous danger that this poses. So what we're going to do when that all emerges, is that's anybody's guess, but hopefully we'll be wise enough to manage it with a certain degree of wisdom we better the autonomous cars that are being developed you know people still think about those as cars but that isn't what they are they're autonomous self-learning robots and the fact that they happen to take the form of cars at the moment is almost irrelevant you know they're no more cars than cars were horseless buggies right they're a whole new thing and what's really interesting about robots like that is that they basically, they're all identical, right? More or less. 
And what that means is that when one learns something, every one of them learns it at the same time. And so even if they're not very bright, if there's 10 million of them, or 100 million of them, and they're all learning one thing a day, that's 100 million new things a day that every one of them is learning. And so they're mapping the road and they're learning how to operate in a natural environment, which is a really big deal. Like it's a really, really big deal. They're learning to map the perception of the world onto action, which is really the definition, a, re a good definition in some sense of intelligence. We don't even know if we need to be worried about Facebook because God only knows if it'll even exist in five years. It could even be the same with Google. So, we, you know, we're worried about machines that are changing so fast that we can't figure out what exactly we should be worried about. Because, I mean, who was thinking about YouTube five years ago? No one. It's like cute cat videos. Who cares about YouTube? But it turns out that YouTube is an unbelievably powerful social force because it makes the spoken word as universally transmissible and as permanent as the written word, right? So it's a Gutenberg revolution. And it might even be more profound than Gutenberg revolution because it's possible that people can listen better than they can read. And they can listen when they're doing other things, which is what happens in the podcast world. Lots of my students now listen to podcasts instead of listening to music, or they listen to podcasts instead of reading. You know, they speed them up. I mean, these are massive, massive technological changes and they're all happening in parallel. We have no idea what the consequences of that are going to be.